Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, that, that your kindness is what causes us to change our mind about stuff. Lord, it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, your mercy is so powerful in our lives that it causes us to change our mind about going the wrong way. Lord, you have the words of life. Where else would we go? Lord, I thank you for your goodness being expressed in lives today. And I just invite you, Holy Spirit, Lord, would you speak to each person? Father, speak to every heart. Lord, awaken us to your words. Awaken us to kingdom reality. God, I pray that you give us a new picture of what the kingdom is like this morning. A fresh vision of it, Lord. Fresh revelation of just how amazing, Lord, of what you have done. Or what this season is really about. The coming of the Lord. God, and all that it means is your kingdom is surging forth in this day. Lord, we thank you for that. And so I pray, Lord, this morning, each one would encounter your word in a fresh way. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Come on. I have, uh, I, I've made jokes about it recently. Um, you know, uh, the, the reality that, that I'm, I'm kind of a one-meeting pastor. One meeting, meaning this, like, if the sustained support of counseling thing, I'm just not your guy because I, 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 it all comes out in one moment. We talk, empathy, compassion, and then it just all is on the table, and then it's like, well, why would we meet again? I, clearly, you know all you need to know now. Right? And, and the, the process of walking people through stuff, how that is clearly, if, if, that, if you and I have had more than one meeting, then it was the grace of God. Right? Sustaining you, sustaining me. I just, because people are wired differently. Not everybody is wired to carry the load of walking with people over an extended journey. Not everybody like, is wired to do that. There's some of us who are. Man, you guys are heroes of mine. You're amazing. I really don't know how you do it. I got friends I've had for years and years and years. Obviously, my wife and I have been married 25 years. But I think that might really be just an example of how she can carry the weight of a problem for 25 years. <laughs> More than my involvement in that. The, the grace of God to walk with people and stay connected, that's a gift. Do you know that? If you have relationships in your life that have lasted longer than just a short season, more than just an agenda, like you're in someone's life as long as you guys are doing something together, if you have a relationship that goes beyond that, it's a gift. It's, a, it's an expression of God's grace working in you to walk in harmony, in union, in connection with people. It's an example of God's redemption in your life. Because... Sin separates. Brokenness separates. Pain separates. Has anybody ever been disappointed? Anybody? Been alive for more than five minutes? <laughs> ever been disappointed? Right? Uh, I mean, I got a, how many Vikings fans I got in the room? I knew you were out there. I just had to poke the right area. Right? Disappointment is the expression of an expectation unmet. And there's reason for hope, and there's reason for being excited about something, but when it doesn't meet your expectations, when it falls short, when it's not the thing you thought it was going to be, it is so easy to part ways. Right? It's super easy to come back together and be connected with someone or something or, you know, cheer for or whatever when everything's going well. What do we, what do we call fans like that? Fair weather fans. And in Minnesota, are there any fair weather fans? No, because there's no fair weather here. It's a winter state. <laughs> right? It's demonstrated in our sports culture. Right? Fair weather fans or bandwagon, right? Like someone jumps on the bandwagon. It's because things are going well, and now I want to be a part of something that's going well. Why? Because 
I don't have the pain of disappointment creating separation in our relationship. How many know, though, like if you're going to have a real relationship, you're going to have to have some tools to move beyond your disappointments. If you're going to have any real relationships, it's one thing, man. It's one thing to attend a church while everything's going well. It's another thing to attend a church for the long haul when stuff isn't. When people are struggling, when it's difficult. When you got to walk through storms with people, man. Like if your social circle is all sunshine and roses, then I would say to you, you don't actually have real friends. A little early, early in the sermon. Sorry, I'll back up. Let's talk about the Vikings again. <laughs> Packers. Let's make Packer jokes, right? Listen, difficulty is a part of walking through life. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. There is something in Christ that allows us to overcome disappointments, to overcome sins, to overcome the pain that people bring into your life, to walk in union with one another. There's something in Christ that allows you to go beyond fair weatherness, go beyond like the only time that we're walking together is when we're doing something in excellence. And if, man, if you fail me though, I'm stepping back. If you parent that way, it's going to be a short-lived relationship with your kids. Because if you keep putting pressure on them to perform, it's going to injure the relationship long-term. Because they're never going to live up to your expectation. And kids already carry that. Every child wants dad to approve of them. Smile. Come on. We're getting real. Uh, This morning, I want to give you the solution. And it's not difficult. It's what Jesus has done for us. And I think sometimes we think about the reality of what Christ has done. We, we, we compartmentalize it. We're going to talk about overcoming disappointments. We're going to talk about mercy. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about that as a concept. But I want to give you real, like, Man, you're going to walk away with some hooks, some some traction here this morning. We change because we start to see something differently. What if we're framing the problem wrong? What what if you're thinking about, you're approaching the problem in in, the, in a way, like, right? We, we, go, we go, okay. We need to solve this problem, and in history, we've only ever solved this problem this way, so we just keep thinking that way. And then the new guy comes along, somebody new to the company, somebody that's not a part of the culture, someone that's, and they just go, hey, uh, why don't we just do it that way? And it's like outside of the box, and you go, oh my goodness, it was there the whole time. I just couldn't see it, because I've been thinking about this wrong. I have been framing the problem wrong. That's what revelation does. The Holy Spirit reveals the word. It's been there the whole time, and then suddenly he just pulls the veil, and you see it differently. And dude, all all of a sudden, you go, oh my goodness, solution's been there the whole time. I have just been approaching it in a difficult way, and it doesn't have to be difficult. And that is good news. Is good news. You guys are going to have a fantastic Christmas, and your relationships with your family are going to be rocking. Right? Like, it's, this is a season for connection for you, not division. This is a season where, where truly the warmth and love and care and connectedness within the family unit, it is more than possible you are going to steward it. I'm declaring these things powerfully over you right now. You should let an amen come across your heart. So be it unto me. Peter brought up the problem. Peter said to Jesus, this is in Matthew 18. We're going to walk through Matthew 18. We're going to look at it differently. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. The rustling of the pages is encouraging. <laughs> turn in your app, too. 
Matthew 18. Peter brings up the problem and he frames it kind of perfectly. And Jesus' response blows them away. And it should blow us away. If you have... If you've been alive in the last six months, if you've been interacting with people, if you have, really, it's longer than six months. It's kind of since 2020. But there is an emotional reaction that is in the world right now um, that's not, like, in line with the activity that's taking place. There's a reactive emotional response out of people right now that, that a moment of frustration will cause an avalanche of emotion in someone where the... It shouldn't have caused that. It's, it's not equal. If you found yourself reacting, triggered, carrying a, a level of emotion in you, and you're like, man, why, why am I stuck here? This message is for you. If you work with people and are having to walk with people who are in that state, this message is for you. Matthew 18, Peter says to Jesus, this is verse 21, Peter came up and he said to him, to the Lord, Lord, how many times, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Like, how long do I maintain connection with somebody that keeps injuring me? How long do I put up with knuckleheads? Right? How many in here have already started a real estate search in Texas? Okay. Yeah, there's like 10 people in here I know of that are. I'm not poking at you. I'm not even making a joke at you. But I am joking at the political climate, right? Because there's some kind of perspective that says, like, man, if I could move, then all my problems will leave me. But have you noticed that there's a commonality with your problems, that they follow you wherever you go? <laughs> Peter goes, hey, Lord, how often shall, when my brother sins against me, I forgive him up to seven times? That's really generous. If you have a friend that keeps disappointing you, like, legitimately causing problems in your life. How, how many times do you have to put up with this? Seven times? The word seven is a prophetic number. The word seven, it, it's a prophetic number. It means perfection. It means, do I, do I keep going in a full cycle of the relationship? Do I, do I push through this? There's prophetic meaning to that. Peter feels like he's got the right answer, and so he's giving it to Jesus. And then Jesus turns it, and I want you to hear this, because I, I, in, in, I, I appreciate different translations of the scriptures. I'm going to share one that you're, it might not be written like this for yours, but I want you to hear it because it's, it's super prophetic. Okay, this is verse 22. Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times. This is the New American Standard Version. But I say to you, 77 times. Now, some versions might say 70 times 7. But, but let me share with you why I think it's actually 77. Both are fine. It's a lot of times. Okay? 77 times is a historical byword. 77 actually has a historical context and a prophetic meaning. 77 points at a moment in history where humanity and culture decided that how they were going to treat betrayal was with vengeance. This is Genesis 4, verse 23. Genesis 4, verse 23. Lamech, who is a descendant of Cain, Cain and Abel, in the beginning, generational tree. It's only like four or five generations back from Cain. Jesus is declaring 77 times, and this is where it comes from. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech. 
for I killed a man for wounding me. In other words, I got even with somebody. I raged when they hurt me. I had an overreaction. And a boy for striking me. So he killed a boy for hitting him. He killed a man for lashing out at him irrationally. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then let Lamech be avenged 77-fold. Do you recognize the quote now? Peter goes seven times, which is the normalcy for society that the fallen nature of man. Cain, the one who originally killed his brother Abel, set the course of society to be away from God's presence, not in God's presence. A lot of history there, right? If Cain is seven times, in other words, if the normalcy of society is that you get revenge just up to seven times, if someone's caught stealing, then you can make them pay back seven times what they stole? That's the normalcy in culture. You pay a fine for stealing from somebody, and the fine will be more than what you stole. Right, a little tax on top of it. Lamech says, no, 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 not seven times, 77 times. In other words, I am gonna be so brutal with anybody who betrays me that no one would dare to betray me. I am going to be so reactive in my response to somebody hurting me that no one would dare to hurt me. That, my, my friends, that's the response of pain. That's not a normal response. A normal response is like, yeah, you hurt me. Okay, we're going to confront, we're going to talk about it, we might yell at each other, we might whatever, right? Like, there's like kind of a normal response. If, if you get in a traffic scuffle, a normal response is for someone to walk away with a ticket because they violated the law. What is not a normal response is if somebody gets out of the car and beats the pulp out of the person who cut them off. That's a 77-fold response. It's a violent reaction that is... And that thing, my friends, that's spiritual. That is a spirit. That's something in culture, it's, it's rooted in pain. It's rooted in rejection. But it's not a good response. And what's Jesus say to Peter? He goes, no, Peter, no, no, no. We're not working with societal norms anymore. I need you to overreact with mercy. I need you to be violent about giving someone mercy. I need you to not just take it on the chin and go, yeah, it's fine. I need you to overreact with such mercy that you serve the person who hurt you, that you give to the person that stole from you. I need you to so overdo mercy that it erases, it goes against that spirit of revenge that's in the world. And then look at what Jesus says. Verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. What is the kingdom of heaven like? That question, this is what Jesus is teaching the disciples. He says, hey, This is what it will be like under my rule. What's the kingdom like? What's what's God's version of society look like? What, what What is it that God is after? What's the picture of what it's supposed to look like? Because, man, I know it when the picture's off, right? You feel that? But we don't always know how to do it. And Jesus gives us a picture here. So we ask the question, we go, what's the kingdom like? What is it like with Jesus as king? What's God after in society? What is the Lord wanting you to behave like in accordance with what his kingdom is like? He needs you to see that clearly so you can behave this way. So what's the kingdom like? Jesus goes, Peter, 
I want you to get violent about mercy. I want you to overdo mercy. And for that reason, because I want you to overdo mercy, this is what the kingdom is like. Let me give you a little story. It's like a king who is choosing to eliminate debt from society. You want to know what Jesus' kingdom's like? It's like this. It is like a country whom government has decided they are zeroing out everyone's debt. We are no longer going to have or allow debt in our nation. It's gone. Done. But you owe me. They owe me. They have a mortgage. They have it. Nope. It's done. Gone. If I'm king, we're getting rid of debt. That's what Jesus says. It's gone. You no longer owe the king anything. And so what's the kingdom of heaven like? This is what the kingdom of heaven's like. It's like a king who has decided that he is going to eliminate all debt. And so they begin to settle the accounts. What does settle the accounts mean? He's not looking for payment. He's zeroing out everyone's account. He's not creating more debt. He's not saying to those who owe, here's some more debt. He is removing debt. What's the kingdom of heaven like? It is like a king who said, we are no longer going to be a society that has any debt. I don't know about you, but that can get me happy. Jesus is saying this, why? Because within society, revenge has been woven into culture. I have to protect myself. I have to get my own. If we're gonna have repayment, like I need repayment and I'm gonna have to defend my right for repayment and I'm gonna have to create that pressure in order for repayment to come. And Jesus is saying, no, what if there's no repayment at all? What if we just go ahead and zero out the debts? This is what heaven's like. What if we read this passage from the point of view that God had paid for all the sin of the world? Paid for it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son that whoever would believe, right? For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but it might be saved through him. Jesus paid for all the sin of the world. The debt for the entirety has been paid. Man, y'all got to let this settle in. You got to let this settle in because this is what will change your life. This right here. This, if you are like, no, debt still exists, Jamie. Sin still owes the price of the crime. Some of us preach that way. Please stop preaching that way. It's not a gospel. You owe God, and so therefore, no, you don't owe God anything. He paid your debt. It's done. He already he determined, I'm going to zero out the debt of the world. I'm going to pay for it all. It's done. This is the problem with how we've approached this passage in the past because we've attempted to create equity. This is what I do, and this is what you do, and this is how we get through this. No, 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 no. This is about zero the debt. Done. It's done. There is no debt. There is no spoon. How many understood that reference? Just wave at me a little bit. Yep. The rest of you, you should watch movies sometimes. (laughs) But only from the 90s, because that's where it came from. All right. (laughs) Jesus is talking about his heavenly father. The heavenly father decided, I'm done with the debt system in humanity. I'm going to pay the debt. It's done. I'm going to zero out the debt. And so the father was seeking to settle all the debt. Jesus is speaking of the reason he came to earth. He's not talking about your relationship with other people. He's talking about his relationship with the world. And then every person and how they respond to Jesus paying their debt. Jesus came to settle all the accounts. That's why he came. 
He came to settle all the accounts. And here's the choice. The choice is either that you are going to let him zero the account or you are going to take personal responsibility for your debt and declare, nope, I can pay it. Just give me enough time. And man, is that the response of religion and humanity. I don't need you. I can do it on my own. What is the kingdom of heaven like? It is like a king who no longer wants anyone to owe a debt to him. No more taxes. Every citizen fully free, no burden of debt towards God. There's no burden of debt in the kingdom. In the kingdom, debt is illegal. You cannot owe to one another. In the debt system of the world cannot be brought into the kingdom. Paul preaches about this later too. And he's like, hey, if somebody hurts you, let them go. Jesus talks about this over and over. And I think we try to like isolate this to kind of mean something we don't want it to mean. But if you borrow money to somebody, then you're like, you must pay me back. Like there is actually a statement that says, you gotta just release people from that. Why? Because in the kingdom, there's no debt allowed. Now you can wrestle with that. You can argue with me. You can whatever. Well, it means this. It's a metaphor. Praise God, it's a metaphor. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and apply it to my life and watch joy come. It'll be great. (laughs) This is who your God is. He does not want you to carry debt. The debt of sin is not to be upon you. You do not owe for the debt of sin. Going your own way no longer carries a penalty with it. That is what's been declared. And that's good news. You're not trying to earn your way out of this. You're not trying to fix your way out of this. It's just done. The parable now, the story, is about someone interacting with a king who has zeroed out the debt and their response to it. This is not instruction about how you're supposed to confront. This is not instruction about how you are supposed to deal with somebody sinning against you. Jesus is saying, listen, seven times, yeah, Peter, that's cute. I want you to go violently at revenge and say, this is not okay. Now, you're gonna have to make your own personal application to that is what Jesus is saying. So here we go, verse 24. When he began, the king began to settle the debts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, I, we, I've, I've heard people like talk about the weight of that debt, of how big it is. I, I like this version maybe better than the monetary because the monetary keeps changing. It's not an X number of dollars. It is 60 million days of labor. 60 million days wages. Now, can I ask you just a practical question? Does anybody in here think you're going to live for 60 million days on planet Earth? You got enough time for that? Anybody? Bueller. That was the 80s talking right there. (laughs) When he began to settle the accounts, one owed him 10,000 talents, 60 million days of labor. But since he did not have the means to repay, duh, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had. Repayment to be made through their lives. Because they don't have 60 million days, and so their lives is what's costing them. It's not he's going to sell them and he's going to make 60 million days of wages back. He's saying, okay, you're trading your life for the debt. Look at the response of the slave. Now, I just want you, the king is already determined. He is removing the debt. This interaction with the slave has nothing to do with it. The king has decided, I'm gonna forgive the sins of the world. We're starting clean. Now, I'm gonna interact with the people who owe me and I'm gonna see their response to this. So the guy comes in. 60 million days of debt, 
And the king goes, okay, well, you're going to need to be sold. This costs your life. Everything about your future is gone because I'm settling the debt. The slave fell to the ground, prostrated himself before the Lord and said, have patience with me, I'll repay you everything. Can you tell me if that's the heart of someone that's receiving a gift or someone that's saying, no, 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 I'll pay you back. Is this someone that's humble or is this someone who is quietly on the inside saying, you can't do anything for me. This isn't someone receiving. This is someone saying, no, no, if you give me enough time, I can earn my way to heaven. My good works will outweigh my bad works, as if that's the scale. The slave fell to the ground, prostrate, and said, have patience with me. I'll repay you everything. And then the Lord had compassion and released him and forgave him his debt. That had nothing to do with that man's response. That man, what was he asking for? He was asking for time. Give me more time, God, and I'll make it worth it to you. Give me more time, God, and my my good works will overcome my debt. Is that ever true? Can somebody ever actually fix the damage they've done? Someone hurt you? Can they actually fix it? No, it's, it's done. You got hurt. They did it. There's nothing you can do. The pain is there. The only answer to this is either that you eliminate them from their, your life. Goodbye, I don't want you in my life anymore. Or you forgive their debt. Your families are so precious. Do you really want them divided? Is your point of view that powerful and that needed? Parents, that you would divorce yourself from a child who isn't going the same direction as you? Don't you think that mercy is what's supposed to? Okay. The slave owed 60 million days of labor. It is an impossible debt. He's never going to repay it. The king is going to settle the debt. The slave's debt is going to be wiped out. But the slave was not receiving the compassion or the mercy. He asked for time. I can work my way out of this. I'll prove it to you that I'll be a faithful husband. No, you won't. You're going to fail again. And it'll be maybe in a different way. But you're going to keep failing. Why? Because you are human. And the only way to remain in the covenant relationship is to continue to forgive each other. You're going to have to let mercy reign. You want to stay in relationship with that son, that daughter who's going a different way than you want them to go? You're going to have to let mercy be your choice. It's the only way. The slave walked away with his debt cleared, but he himself never acknowledged his need for mercy. He didn't acknowledge what the king was actually doing. He walked away and went, woo, I have more time. And we know it didn't transform him because his actions immediately following him tells us what's going on in the slave's heart. How do you know if you're walking in mercy? How do you know if you've received transformational mercy of the blood of Jesus, removing your debt, you have been set free? How do you know that you are saved? By the way you forgive others. By the way that violation to you, how you respond. Did it actually settle the account, or are you still working from a debt system? Do you still feel like people owe you? Friend, be careful, because the king has decided that the debt system is eliminated from his kingdom. It's illegal to behave this way. Forgiveness was paid, and the slave still wanted his. We know that mercy didn't transform him because of his actions. Look at verse 28. The slave went out and he found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. That's three months 
90 days of work. 60 million days of work or 90 days of work? He seized him and he began to choke him and he said, pay back what you owe. The fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me, I'll repay. Have we heard this one before? But he was unwilling and he went and he threw him into prison until he should pay back all that he owed. I kind of wonder sometimes if the accusations that we have against people are actually what's going on inside of us. Okay? We hold accusations in our hearts against people who don't live up to our expectations. And so disappointment is what we use to defend our vengeance. So I need to say, I probably need to say that again. Okay, let me read that again. <clears throat> we hold accusations in our hearts against people who don't live up to our expectations. And so disappointment is what we use to defend tearing them down. We use our disappointment as a defense of tearing another person down. But does that actually speak to their actions or is it talking about what's going on inside of you? I know it's talking about what's going on inside of you because you clearly have not allowed the king's mercy to transform your heart. That's why it's manifesting. I'm, disappointment, I'm disappointed you owe me and you're defining what they owe you. That's actually talking about what God's dealing with inside of you, not them. The man's debt was paid on the outside, but he was still carrying the debt on the inside. If you, if Jesus has paid the debt of the world, but you don't let his mercy transform your insides, your life will keep expressing the pain and weight of sin. Because forgiven people choose to forgive people. That principle is seen everywhere Right? We love because he first loved us. You've got to have it touch your life, and then you can express it. We see God, and then we're transformed into his likeness. That's because when you see him, he is revealed, and you become something. You can't become something until you see it. The sign that you have been saved is that you have mercy on people who don't deserve it. You're in the kingdom because you behave this way. Verse 31, when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved. They came and they reported to the Lord all that had happened. What are they reporting? They're reporting somebody violating the king's rule. The king's rule was there's no debt. The king's rule is you don't get to hold debts over people because I've chosen to eliminate debt. So the kingdom is like a king who eliminated all the debt, and then this guy who did not receive the mercy goes out and tries to express the law, holds the other slave accountable. You owe me. The other slaves, the people around him go, oh my goodness, and they're grieved. Why? Because the king had wiped out all the debt. So they go report it to the king. They go, man, somebody is still behaving like the old nature. Someone is still behaving like people owe you. Someone's still behaving like Lamech or Cain in the kingdom. And the king, look at what it says. He summoned him and said, you wicked slave. I forgave all the debt. Should you not also have had mercy? In the same way that I had mercy on you. And then the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the tormentors until he repaid all that he owed him. And then Jesus' statement here is so powerful and it should shock and awe you. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Romans 12 says, never take 
your own revenge, beloved. Leave room for the Lord's wrath. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. You don't overcome evil. You don't overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. 77 times, not just seven. You're not just forgiving them. You need to eliminate debt in that person's life. If someone hurts you, that is your opportunity to release the true gospel over them. I know it's the last thing your emotions want to do, but you gotta rise up, y'all. You gotta rise up. You gotta get militant. You gotta get violent over this. Vengeance does not belong in the kingdom by you. You gotta hand that over to the Lord. You gotta let go of the results. However, the play, what you do, oh, you rise up and you do so much good to somebody that in their life they go, oh my goodness, I will never do somebody harm again. Why? Because goodness has overcome me. The the king moved with anger, handed him over to torment until he paid back all that he owed. What did he owe? The king gives mercy, forgives the debt. So the debt is gone. What does the man owe? What was the man looking for in the response of the slave? That the slave would also behave in that same manner, that he would release debt. So what does the slave owe? Why is the slave tormented? Why is there, why why do you feel the weight of justice and injustice so heavily? It's shackles weighing you down. I need justice. That's not a godly cry. But it's my intercession, pastor. Don't take it from me. Jesus did that. I didn't. Justice belongs to him. Judgment belongs to him. The execution of results belongs to him, not our job. Our job is to what? Be militant about mercy. In other words, you don't owe me anything, friend. I'm unlocking your future. That'll transform your dinner table. Your kid, when they're trying to get your goat because they're talking about something that is like the opposite of what they know you believe, they know what you believe. Why you think they're bringing it up at the dinner table? (laughs) They're testing. They're testing you. How do you respond? With fear? Control? Anger? Do you got to get even with them? What's going on in your heart? It's an invitation for you to overwhelmingly, over the top, be good to them and watch their lives get transformed. How many times should I forgive someone, Jesus? How many times should I let them back into my life? How many times should I do that? Seven times? What's a good number, isn't it? Doesn't feel right. Just seven. Equal, you know, like, you did it to me, I did it to you, we're good. No, friend. How you eliminate that pain from your child's life or from that friend's life or you want that relationship restored forever, awesome. Do good to them, like overwhelmingly, 77 times. Get militant about mercy. We're heading into the holidays. We're closing out 2023. Wouldn't it be nice if you got a phone call from good old President Biden? And he said, wow, I have good news for you. I've eliminated your debt. You don't owe anybody anything. How does your heart respond to that? I felt it. You get whoop, tightness. Isn't there certain groups that deserve vengeance? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to come down with a hammer 77 times over what somebody did. That's how we get them to stop being evil in the world. Or, I don't know, maybe.
maybe the kingdom is another way. Maybe kingdom response, the king, the king of kings response and the kingdom that you are a part of is supposed to respond differently than the world. And so when we find our hearts aligning with 77 times, understand that that most likely is a picture of you not receiving mercy for yourself. It's a reflection of what's going on in your own heart. It's an expression of, yeah, we need the bad guys to get theirs. That's an expression of you feeling like the bad guys in your life haven't got theirs. It's displaying your heart. It's not talking about what's right or wrong. It's just talking to you. Don't fall for the evil trap. Don't fall for the bait of Satan to hold a fence and to make sure they get what's coming to them. Don't fall victim to a kingdom that is in control and power. No, the kingdom of heaven looks like this. The king went, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. Everybody gets a car. We're all forgiven. You're all released. You don't owe me anything. And by the way, I want you to go ahead and do that for others. And now you understand why the gospel is scandalous. Because it's not about you get yours, I get mine. It's a debt-free kingdom. The debt of sin is not allowed to be maintained by its people. The citizens of the kingdom don't get to hold on to debts that they like and let go of the ones they don't. You have no permission to hold on to offense towards somebody else. It's illegal. It's illegal. It's illegal. Hey, look at your neighbor and go, I think it's illegal. I don't think you get to be mad at Uncle Susie anymore. Hey, Dad, I think we got to let that one go. I know, they're a different political party. Oh, my gosh, we can't eat with them. I think we got to let that one go. I think we got to have mercy. Just stand to your feet. Forgiveness and mercy are not optional to the followers of Jesus. They're not options. Forgiveness is the choice to let it go, to let go of the offense. Mercy is the choice to turn over justice to Jesus. In other words, the result of this, what happens, the outcomes, you got to let it go. You got to let Jesus be the one who gets to conduct outcomes. That is how you end up free. That's how you end up condemnation-free, how stuff won't stick to you anymore. Just put a hand on your own heart this morning. Oh, joy to the world. The king has come. Peace on earth and goodwill. He forgave the sins of the world. What about you? Has there been a moment in your life where you have let go of your right to pay your own debts, make your own way, and you've gone, okay, turns out I actually need you, God? Are you still clinging to worthless deeds? You gotta let it go, friend. You gotta let the Lord's mercy transform your insides. People don't owe you and you don't owe God. He forgave you. He released you. Will you receive it this morning? Because if you receive it, see, it's the greatest gift of all time. It is the gift of eternal life. You did not deserve it. It is not by your works. Nobody gets to boast before God. Oh, I made it. I did it. Nope, you don't. You only can receive. God is about to take all the pain and the pain, the, the sorrow, the stuff that has caused big messes. He's about to take all of that and he's about to wipe it clean and release mercy over your family. But it's like a domino. It's got to start with you. I know that you made bad choices. Are you willing to be forgiven this morning? Are you willing to let it go? Or are you still trying to work? I know somebody else hurt you. 
Do you need them to do something before you trust again? Or can you go ahead and release it to the Lord this morning? How about becoming militant about mercy and kindness, overcome evil by heaping goodness on those who have hurt you? What's it look like? Someone stole from you? Awesome. How about writing a $1,000 check and go dropping it off in their mailbox as a gift to the person who swindled you? You think that would do something to your heart? I bet you'd be free from the pain of it. Father in heaven, I thank you that your hand is upon your people and that the good news of Jesus, that you're with us in this process and that your kingdom looks like a debt-free kingdom. I'm so glad, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the jubilee of heaven, the kingdom jubilee, the release of all debt. God, I thank you for that. I bless your people this morning. I declare mercy over you, my friend. The Holy Spirit has come The Holy Spirit has come and he is anointed for the purpose of releasing people from sin. He has anointed you as a priest. You need to be and receive this mercy and then you get to extend it to others. And so friend, if you'll receive this morning before that Christmas gathering, announce to your home, announce to the heavens, declare over your family Lord, I release every one of these people from the debt they owe me. I let go of my pain. Yes, they disappointed me. Yes, they hurt me. Dad did such and such. Mom did such and such. This morning, Lord, I am unlocking our family that mercy would flow. I'm no longer holding the debt. Holy Spirit, let it start with me. So I receive your mercy afresh this morning, Lord, and I proclaim it to our families. Be forgiven, be released. No more debt. You don't owe me nothing. God, I bless your people. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May his kindness and his face and favor mark your life. His grace provide for you and heap upon him his goodness upon you. And his peace would guard your hearts and your minds. That you live in this kingdom of bounty debt-free in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody who dared to agree with this message said, amen. Come on, can we give a good clap to the Lord this morning?